controversial French film called Cuties. A Tyler, Texas grand jury indicted the streaming service for promoting, quote, lewd visual material against the peace and dignity of the state. But a Netflix spokesperson says the charges are without merit and they stand by the film. If guilty, the corporation could be fined at least $20,000. Well, the Internet Safety Organization Enough is Enough is calling on the Department of Justice to investigate cuties. Enough is Enough President Donna Rice Hughes joins us now. Donna, great to see you. How are you? Good to be with you. Well, uh, you are calling for the Justice Department to get involved. Why do you believe that they need to be a part of this? Well, we initially called on the Justice Department to investigate on child pornography charges. And it's clear to us that the uh, Netflix as well as the Cuties producers are clueless about uh, child pornography and what constitutes child pornography. And when, when we saw this film, it's clear that there are child pornography violations. So to have a federal investigation and indictment on top of the Texas grand jury indictment sends a very loud message not only to Netflix but to other streaming platforms that there is a zero tolerance policy against this type of content. And one thing that a, a lot of people may not realize is that Netflix is still defending their um, the film on the basis that this is a social commentary on the issue of the sexual exploitation of children. But what's so ironic, John, is that the, the very children that they are, are attempting to, to, to say are being sexually exploited in our culture, they are sexually exploiting these 12, 13-year-old actresses by having them perform stripper-type moves, gyrating on, on stage in skimpy clothes, and even one actress actually is seen in a, in a scene uh, pulling down her pants and her underwear and taking a picture of her private parts and then posting that online. And so they have really gone over the top, and this is simply unacceptable. And we're also calling on Netflix to remove this film from their platform. And, they, and if they do this soon, they may be able to avoid a federal indictment. You can understand the backlash after that description there, Donna. Given your organization's focus on protecting children online, what are your major concerns with kids in front of screens all day now that we have the coronavirus lockdowns? Thank you for asking that question because it's so important. Kids have always been at risk when they're online because they have access to all the good and all the bad. And so criminals have always been using this technology. But with kids at home more and doing virtual learning, we have seen skyrocketing cases of child pornography, for instance. And um, the incidences of kids sexting has gone up dramatically. Sexual predators and sex traffickers are even more active online because the internet is their primary tool to recruit and groom kids as well as to sell them and also and to Donna. sell women. Real quickly, because we have just a little less than a minute left, I'd like to ask, how would you encourage parents to help protect their children without having to stand over their shoulders all day? Yes. Um, well, first of all, go to our website at enough.org. We've got five steps to mitigate harm during COVID, and it's right up there on our homepage. And I would also ask your viewers to please sign this petition um, calling on Netflix to remove cuties on a, and on the DOJ right. to investigate. Uh, agreement that you've had in the Middle East for peace in 26 years. The last one was 1994 between Israel and Jordan. 
Uh, Saudi Arabia has obviously been a great leader in making modernization, but uh, you can't turn a battleship around overnight. I think that uh, President Trump has, you know, again, his first trip was to Saudi Arabia. He's worked very closely with King Salman, with the, the Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. And what he's uh, worked very closely on is how do we get Saudi Arabia more aligned with U.S. policy? And we've been able to do that. Number one is we've worked very hard together to counter Iran, which has been very important. Uh, number two, we started a joint terror finance center with Saudi Arabia, where we're able to stop a lot of the money that's been going to terrorism. Uh, number three, and maybe the most important for the long-term uh, gain, is we started a center to combat extremism online. Saudi Arabia is the custodian of the two holy sites. It's the most um, one of the leaders of the Muslim world. And what we've been able to do with them is to get them focused on how do we get uh, people to not distort the religion of Islam and to be real leaders in, in going against radicalization. They've done that. They've also taken great steps to modernize their society. Under President Trump's uh, term, you know, in, in partnership, uh, they've uh, allowed women to start driving. They've relaxed their garden, Stories guardianship. Stories we've covered on CNBC. Yeah, yeah. And, and so, so you've seen a lot of progress in Saudi Arabia. I would also say that if you follow the, the, the press and the statements in Saudi Arabia, they've been quite supportive of the initiative that happened yesterday. So my sense with Saudi Arabia is uh, they have a, a, a two different uh, populations there. They have their younger population that, uh, that wants to see partnership with Israel. They're interested in economy, Vision 2030, technology. They want better lives. They see Israel as almost the Silicon Valley of the Middle East, and they want to be connected to it uh, as a trading partner, as a technology partner, as a security partner. Then you have the older generation there that's still stuck in conflicts of the past. And I think that people will watch, see how this goes there. I do think we have other countries that are very interested in moving forward. Uh, and, uh, and then as that progresses, I, I do think it's an inevitability that Saudi Arabia and Israel will have uh, fully normalized relations and they'll be able to do uh, a lot of great things together. So I just want to say, because the, the you know, the way that your, your question came is that uh, yesterday was a, a, a real historic breakthrough in the region and, uh, and I think will lead to a lot of great things. Forty organizations around the world are working on a vaccine and collaborating with one another. And every day we're getting closer to finding one. And it's very promising to start with. A handful of them have even reached the point where they're testing the vaccine on thousands of humans, something called a phase three trial. Not quite uh, popping the Prosecco uh, just yet. A lot has to happen before we can know that a vaccine works and that it's safe. What exactly is a vaccine? Well, it's like a training course for our body's immune systems. They harmlessly show viruses or bacteria to our body. Our immune systems recognize them as an invader and learn how to fight them. It means that next time, when we encounter the disease for real, our bodies already know how to handle it. There's a lot we don't understand about COVID-19, but we know it's genetic code. Some scientists are lifting parts of this code and combining it with existing viruses to create something that looks like the coronavirus. This can then be given to animals or humans. Others are injecting pieces of raw genetic code, such as DNA, straight into test subjects. Whichever approach is used, when researchers think they've found something that works, it has to be tested again and again and again, and go through so many clinical trials to make sure that it's effective and that there are no unintended side effects. And even after that, it still needs to be approved by medical regulators. The reality is that most of the vaccines being trialled right now will fail. When can you get the vaccine? Well, most scientists seem to think it'll be the second half of 2021 at the earliest. And that might seem far away to you. But vaccines usually take years, if not decades, to develop. And then you've got to make this vaccine on a massive scale. 
Some countries, such as the UK and the USA, are already spending money to secure vaccines for their own populations. But the World Health Organization is also taking steps to try and ensure that all countries have equal access to a vaccine, no matter who discovers it or how much money a country is willing to offer for it. The plan is for healthcare workers to get vaccinated first, then 20% of each country's population will be given the vaccine. The idea is to have vaccinated 2 billion people by the end of 2021.